Uh, good afternoon, everybody. I take a little pause because I know that lunch was uh, quite a bit, and we're all going to try to take a nap. So I'm going to give you a pop quiz. Now, don't be ashamed. How many of you heat your homes with fossil fuels? Come on, stand up. It's exercise time. Stand up. Fossil fuel heaters. It's okay. We'll get to you. <laughs> it, it, it just uh, reassures me that we're in a target-rich environment. Everybody we know, probably 90% of them are heating with fossil fuels. So there's nowhere to go but up when you, when you talk about applying geothermal. Um, also, I'm going to disappoint you a little bit today. I'm sure the reason you're here today is because of my partners in crime, David, uh, oh, sudden blank. Uh, he's on the program. Um, and Jens Ponikow, fascinating people that when I applied to uh, present this topic to, at this forum, they said, go for it. And about a month ago, I said, okay, guys, where are we going to meet out there? And they said, well, we drew straws, and you got the short one. So here I am. You're stuck with just me. But, I, but I'll tell you, there's a lot of thought that's gone into this very simple topic. So I'm going to start the process here, I think. Do you have a little remote gizmo? Yeah, there should be a remote on the podium. We should have checked for that. <clears throat> here we go. Uh -huh. Yeah, that should just forward and backward. Like, yeah, there we go. Excellent. Learning objectives. Just want to introduce you to the concept of direct a load. I want to share the merits and results of a program called Transus. How many of you have heard of Transus? Okay. Uh, illustrate the direct to load result in a 10% energy savings. Share the field experience that is, supports this empirical or uh, derived claim. Reinforce the why. Why is it important to squeeze 10% out of a geothermal system? And these are my partners in crime, Jens Ponikow. One of the most interesting guys I've ever met. Only guy I know who uh, had his picture on the front page of the Wall Street Journal above the fold and does geothermal for fun. So, David Bradley, graduate of uh, Wisconsin University and is probably one of the experts in the world running the Transus program. So, Direct the load. A simple change in hydronic piping. Let me ask, how many live in a home heated hydronically? So I'm sort of in a target-rich environment in the Northeast that there's over a million homes heated hydronically with fuel oil. So you talk about opportunities. So this topic deals with hydronic heating or cooling. Now, we traveled a long way to get here. My wife and I had to go through the checklist of what to fill into the wagon to start our trek out here. And indeed, we started our trek. We uh, made a wrong turn in St. Louis. Ended up in Stillwater, bought a t-shirt at Eskimo Joe's. So life is good. But we eventually got here to deliver a simple message. And that is, do this, not this. I repeat, do this, not this. 
Any questions? <laughs> There's a question I suppose I ought to answer is what the hell are you talking about? Um, so indeed, let's review what we are being told as far as how to pipe a hydronic heating system. And this is directly out of commonly available literature. Obviously, it's affiliated with a certain manufacturer, but they all do the same thing. And I'm going to show you multiple examples. There's one thing that drives the temperature need in a hydronic system. That is your load, not the heat pump, not the buffer tank, not outdoor temperature, although they all contribute. It's your load. It's your distribution device. It, how efficient is it at a given temperature? Can we get enough BTUs delivered at the lowest possible temperatures that a heat pump enjoys? So those, that's the driver, is your baseboard, your radiators, your fan coils, you name it. There's a distribution device in a hydronic system that is going to demand a certain temperature, and you've got to provide it. It's that simple. Another one, different manufacturer, but again, we're sending to the load the same temperature water we're sending to the heat pump. Now, that makes that heat pump work a little harder because it's going to add 8, 10, 12 degrees of heat to that water, send it back to the buffer tank where it gets thoroughly mixed so that the, by, by the time you come out of a buffer tank and go to the load, which is dictating a certain temperature, all of a sudden you're sending that same temperature water to the heat pump. Another variation, which is a little closer to ideal, but not perfect. And the big complaint I would register on all these diagrams is the word storage. There is no way that a buffer tank should be considered storage. We turn over that tank like every two to three minutes. So if the heat pump wasn't there to add more heat, how long do you think that storage would last? About 15 minutes. So the whole point of a buffer tank is to simply prevent short cycling of the heat pump. Heat pumps do not like to be short cycled. So the buffer tank provides a degree of thermal inertia to allow that heat pump to run six, eight, ten minutes under the lowest of loads. So you size your buffer tank based on uh, the capacity of the heat pump relative to your load, also some control nuances, which I'll speak about later. But every diagram you're going to find in every book out there indicates something like this. We go to the heat pump, come back from the heat pump, put it in the buffer tank. We go out of the buffer tank and go to the load and come back to the buffer tank, mixing in the buffer tank. And this essentially is that last picture I showed you, but we drew it a little differently. This is the basis for our initial base case modeling. And it represents the best case that I've seen documented in any literature and is what we modeled as the base case. So the other variations that I showed you earlier would even show greater results than this one because at least in the one there, we, we were coming out of the top of the tank to go to the load.
But the reality is there is no stratification in these tanks. They're turned over so quickly that it's a big mixing pot. And this is direct to load. It is a very subtle difference. But we come out of the heat pump and allow that most precious water in the system. It could be the hottest water in the wintertime. It could be chilled water in the summertime. But it's what you've paid to get. You've paid to create that temperature water that can meet your need and not thermally dilute it in some piping scheme. So this simple T located above a buffer tank prevents any mixing, any thermal dilution. And indeed, the, these piping systems are set up as primary secondary. The heat pumps are the primary side. We're going to pump when they're running. We're going to stop pumping when they turn off. The load side, we're going to pump whenever there's a call. So there's always going to be a degree of imbalance between the primary and secondary side. And that branch circuit off the T allows that water to go right into the buffer tank. So it, it's almost simple, too simple to even talk about, but I would encourage you all when looking at hydronic system designs of any scale, commercial scales too, that you take that most precious water that's coming out of the heat pump and put it to use immediately without diluting it. Now, we got a kid in our shop who loves 3D. So I had him whip this up for me, and it sort of illustrates the, the realistic components in these systems. You got the buffer tank, you come out the bottom, you have a dedicated pump that cycles with the heat pump. And you come out of that heat pump and you go through that T located above the buffer tank. Now you'll notice there's a little shutoff valve in that branch circuit going back to the buffer tank. And I'll talk about that in a minute. We go to the right, we see an air separator, an expansion tank. We feed into a variable speed pump. We put purge ports on both sides of that pump so we can completely fill this system without running potentially dirty water through the pump. And that's where that valve on top of the tank comes in because coming back from our load devices, radiant floors or fan coils, we're going to go into the buffer tank and the path of least resistance is to go right out the top of the tank back to the other purge port. So we simply close that valve. That forces the water to go through the heat pumps and now you can fill your entire system with two purge ports on either side of the variable speed pump. We put zone valves on every zone. And I'll be the first to admit that we get a lot of pushback about guys who love to put individual circulators on in each circuit. And I would compare pump watts any day to that style. Now, the plus side is individual circulators indeed give you much higher reliability. If one pump fails, well, you only got one zone down. If a variable speed pump sail fails, the whole system shuts down and the replacement cost on a variable speed pump that typically has about a three-year warranty is quite high. So there are some drawbacks, but I think if, if you're good in water quality to fill these systems properly and get them operating uh, in the best of conditions, good water quality, low pressure drops, controls, these pumps should last a long time. And uh, if you're going to do a lot of these, I would have a spare pump on your shelf just in case. What's, what's, uh, what the control of that pump? Is that like a pressure transducer or? 
No, we use a lot of the uh, velo stratus pumps, which have an internal control algorithm for constant delta P. So regardless of how many zone valves open up, that pump is only going to operate fast enough to maintain the pressure that you've set it at, typically 16, 20, 24 feet ahead. Well, so if three of those are down, are you overflowing the one that's open? No, because of the constant pressure. You're going to set it up in the field, and you're going to look at every one of your flow paths, and you're going to verify you have proper flow through every circuit, and one of them will dictate. It's going to have a certain pressure drop at that desired flow. All the other ones may need less flow or less head. In some cases, you may have to put a balance valve on there. But in general, if you do your design homework right, you tune all those pressure drops to be relatively close. And if one's off by 10, 20, 30 percent, nobody's going to know. They're highly tolerant of off-design flow rates. But it's all built into the pump, uh, and Grunfuss makes them the same way. I know everybody else is uh, uh, coming together on control of ECM pump technology. So we also disable the pump if there is no call at all. We call that demand enabled. Any other, uh, while well, we get a little pause in the action? Okay. Well, in that application, do you need the storage tank or the buffer tank? You do, because you've got to take the smallest zone. You've got to say, okay, maybe it's only one gallon a minute. Now I've got a, maybe a five-ton heat pump that ideally I'd like 15 gallons a minute. So when I only got one zone open, I'm running 14 GPM through that buffer tank. If I didn't have a tank and it was only a pipe, it would quickly trip off, uh, nothing to turn it off. So there's got to be some buffering. Now, I'm looking anxiously forward to the variable speed water-to-water -water heat pumps that are right on the horizon. And they're coming. You're building one. I want one. You got your first sale. <laughs> so, in this diagram, sorry, I'm asking all the questions here, but that diagram is there. The tank is there to protect the heat pump from uh, low flow. It's to protect it from short cycling. Well, can you take your pointer to show me the, the water flow on that? Can you, can you repeat the questions for the... Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. I forgot. Could you repeat your question? Then I might have a chance of repeating it. <laughs> well, my, my point was that the tank was really, uh, I thought maybe it was to keep the flow right for the heat pump, but you're saying that's not the case. Right. The question's regarding, is the buffer tank really there to protect the flow rate to the heat pump? The answer is no. The flow rate is dictated by the pressure drop of that circuit going through the heat pump, through the piping, and back into the buffer tank. So there's a certain known pressure drop at 15 gallons a minute. You pick a pump that can give you 15 gallons a minute at that pressure drop. But wouldn't it short cycle through the tank rather than going through the devices out there? I mean, no, as soon as you turn your velo stratus on, it's going to deliver flow. <laughs> And it's not so going to be denied. That top pump's going to overcome your little circulator. Well, this little pump is making the hottest water in the system available to that secondary pump to draw from. And it will draw whatever it needs. Um, it, it's not overpowering it because, indeed, any flow imbalance will go down through the buffer tank and right back to the heat pump. And if we didn't have 30 or 50 gallons of buffering storage, 
that heat pump may only run 90 seconds uh, or would get trouble some other way. So, got it. okay. So, so it's a buffering system at, as opposed to what they're commonly labeled as a storage tank. There is no storage element to it because of the massive amounts of BTUs we're delivering. A 50 gallon buffer tank is not storing energy. Right. And you got two paths of water. How do you stop? How do you keep the water only going through the storage the buffer tank and not have a parallel path also through the heat pump? Well, it's a path of least resistance. Well, yeah, you're going to have a little bit of flow because the, the uh, delta P between the two is going to be some. And so you're going to get flow through the heat pump and through the tank. So you're going to be blending some. Indeed, and, and to repeat that question is beyond my skill level, but I'll try. It's basically when the secondary loop is running by itself and the heat pump is not energized, not operating, how much of the flow is going to go up and out the buffer tank as opposed to a small amount of flow that might trickle through the heat pump? And I would suggest, well, seconds later, the heat pump's probably going to turn on because we're re reducing the temperature in the buffer tank, which is where we have our sensor. So, yeah, it's going to run for a while as long as we got hot water in the top of the tank and we can feed it and the sensor in the tank is not calling for the heat pump, then the heat pump is off. But literally within minutes, it'll probably turn back on again. So a little bit of flow, and I would guess you, you're less than 2% of your flow is going to migrate through that heat pump as opposed to simply going straight up the buffer tank an hour. And the buffer tank has very little minimum. Yeah. Excellent point. Okay, I, I like healthy discussions like that, but we'll keep on trucking. Why direct a load? There's 14 million homes in America that are hydronically heated. So it's incumbent upon us if we're going to tackle any of these hydronic challenges and every one of them is unique in that I've wrestled with many of them and no two are alike. From baseboard to staple up to above floor radiant to radiators, you're gonna run into everything in the field possible, most of it stacked against you. That if you simply went out and did a hydronic change out of an oil boiler to a geothermal and didn't care about energy, you could be in trouble. You might have a COP of 2.3, which frankly is not good enough for our industry. So you got to focus on the energy and everything that contributes to it. Big market potential. Heat pump efficiencies, as I mentioned, are very sensitive to temperature. Now, Folks can say condensing boilers are also sensitive to temperature, but you're only talking a few percentage points. Geothermal, every degree, is worth at least 1%. So it, it's very sensitive. And a 10% efficiency gain is significant when competing against fossil fuels. Because if you haven't figured it out by now, water-to-air heat pumps are fundamentally more efficient than water-to-water -water unless you can drive your delivery temperatures down. Now, I've created a sort of benchmark of somewhere between 95 and 105 degrees. 
If I can't get my radiant needs below that, then a water-to-air solution will probably be more efficient. But you don't want to be ripping people's houses apart to put in ductwork just to go water-to-air. So, transits. Let me speak for a minute about transits since you're not familiar with it. Uh, developed at the University of Wisconsin probably 35, 40 years ago to model transient conditions in solar thermal systems. It has evolved to become one of the most powerful HVAC mechanical system modeling tools you can dream up of. One minute time steps of analyzing the flow through a system and doing the heat transfer, the thermodynamic, the flows, the pressure drops, all those calculations are redone every minute. So it's a pretty powerful tool and when David got it up and running, indeed he can create all sorts of pretty graphs and things that uh, I wish he were here to really tell you the nuts and bolts of. But he turned it on at 5 o'clock at night when he went home, and it was just finishing up when he got there the next day. So it's 16 hours of computer time on a pretty good uh, horsepower computer. So you cannot dispute the the intent of this modeling to really get a granular perspective of what's going on in a system. Um, this is a typical day. It shows temperature, cycling of equipment. Uh, you'll see a very similar graph later on with actual field data. So without a doubt, Transis is an extremely powerful tool. Uh, myself and two of my uh, cronies that uh, work for me went to, went to get training. We spent three days getting trained. We went back home, and three months later, we still couldn't figure out how to run it. So it's not for the weak of heart. It's a powerful tool that takes a lot of structure to get it to do what you want it to do. But I encourage you, if it's uh, something that floats your boat, go check it out. So what is the essence of the modeling? Okay. I can almost read that. Um, modeled both a base case and a direct-to-load solution. With only... The only difference in the two systems was that first picture I showed you. Rather than go into the buffer tank from the heat pump, we went into a T above the buffer tank. That's the only difference. Maintain the same supply water temperature throughout the model. So independent of which piping system we had, the the radiant devices, the, what we were modeling to deliver the heat, demanded a certain temperature. So regardless of which piping scheme, we maintained that supply temperature for both systems. But we also incorporated outdoor reset. And if you're not familiar with outdoor reset, it's a very simple algorithm that lowers your set point as the outdoor temperature becomes milder. So you want a peak temperature when it gets to your coldest possible day, but most of the year you can meet your heat needs at a much lower temperature. Now we modeled it at a 90 degree max, 110 degree max, and 140 degree max, just to cover the spectrum of potential hydronic applications. Use demand-enabled control logic on the, both the secondary pump and the heat pump itself. We would not allow the heat pump to run 
unless there was a call for heat. Where our goal is not to maintain a buffer tank because it's infinitesimal amount of storage anyway. Why keep it at some temperature? So we monitor all the zones and we say, okay, I got a call. Turn the secondary pump on. We read the uh, aquastat in the buffer tank. If we're below our desired set point, we will turn the heat pump on. But if we're at or above our set point, we don't turn the heat pump on. So demand enabled is a key part of good control logic. Uh, perform minute by minute, system wide calculations, some 500,000 time steps to determine the difference in overall performance. The key indicator, what dropped out of all this, which we sort of knew going in, but at least this quantified it pretty precisely, is the entering water temperature of the heat pump. That's what changes the performance of the heat pump. So when you boil down all these tremendous uh, massive data calculations, I present it like this. The red being our base case that on average had a 86.7 degree entering water temperature into the heat pump. Whereas the direct to load had 78.4. Eh, well, that's not a whole lot of difference. Then we look at cooling and it became even more dramatic. That if we can deliver the chilled water that's coming out of the heat pump directly to air condition with, we're even going to get a more substantial change between the two. Our focus is more on the heating side, but I'll look at both of them briefly here. Anybody who's played around with heat pumps at all recognize that kind of table. You know, you sit there, you interpolate, you try to figure out where your heat pump's going to run, um, and you focus in on those areas that are of interest, certain source temperatures, certain load temperatures, certain flow rates, and you keep burrowing down, you end up interpolating. I happen to choose 40 degree entering source as my average source for both cases. And I can tell you that at I, I, to meet identical loads annually, the average temperature entering the heat pump of 86.7 down to 78.4, you can see all the operating characteristics of that heat pump. Some 500 watts lower in compressor energy. 500 watts, that's a fair amount. That translates to a COP of going from 4.0 to 4.4. It's a 10% increase. Now, if we got any heat pump designers in the room, what, what would you have to pay to make a heat pump operate 10% better? You'd have to buy bigger heat exchangers. You'd have to do things that cost you money. And by a simple piping change, we're getting there with the cost of a T. So, we did lose less than 1% capacity, but we gained 10% in COP. Now we're going to take a quick look at cooling. Again, you get a similar table to interpolate and find the operating condition of that heat pump. And indeed, the difference between a 44.4 entering load and a 54.6 has significant benefits. Capacity going up is one of them. So I get a 6% increase in capacity and 5.1% increase in cooling efficiency. But being that it's a little bigger in capacity, it's not going to run as long to meet the same load. So you combine the two, it's roughly a 10% benefit. Again, just by piping it differently. Field verification. This is uh, where uh, 
Dr. Jens Ponikow stepped up, and he has many well server sites, and I encourage you to go to buffalogeothermal.com. He's got them all available for you to look at. He likes to put his artwork together describing the system. I think this one happens to be a seven ton water furnace, high temp heat pump, uh, two stage, but it's piped direct to load. And of course he shows the source side and he also put a variable speed pump on the source side. These are some charts. A 24 hour period, the outdoor temperature change um, my eyes were better, I could tell you. It was March 11th, just a few days ago. So indeed, it got pretty cold during the night, was warming up during the day. Uh, the previous day was warm. And these are the supply temperatures, the buffer tank temperatures, and the entering water temperatures going into the heat pump. And the supply, regardless of outdoor temperature in our changing set point, is always above the buffer tank. So we can actually set our buffer tank a little lower. If we need 120 going to the load, I would suggest setting your buffer tank at 112. And it, would, it, it is controlling the operation of the heat pump, but when it turns the heat pump on, we deliver hot water right to the load, and then it cycles off when the tank becomes satisfied. Question? Uh, a second ago, you mentioned, and I liked it, that you're using the actual controls in the space to dictate the demand. And here you're saying you're using the tank. Can you clarify that? Yeah, the question is, uh, there are controls out in the space that control the call for heat. And then there's a control in the buffer tank to, to clarify these two control arenas, if you will, because you, you've got to have a control out in the space, basically a thermostat that says, I need heat. So it opens the zone valve. That's all it does. Yeah, so I, I understand the control logic. So earlier I thought you were saying that you were not using the office dot control to bring the unit on. No, we still need a tank temperature. Right and it will cycle the heat pump on and off as needed as long as there is a call for heat. So we, the way we do it is we monitor every one of those zone valves and switches. And if any one of them is closed, we allow our buffer tank control to turn on the heat pump. Okay, that's the clarity I was looking for. Okay. Because it sounded like you were just using the office style, which I didn't understand. Nope. It, Hey, we, we happen to be a fan of the Tecmar boiler type controls, but I hate the word boiler, so we're going to have to do something about that. But they have pre-programmed in the outdoor reset okay. and a demand call input. So if there's not a call for heat, we don't give it a demand call, which disables the control. Another question somewhere? Proper location for the sensor and your scenario here? Well, you're, you're often left to the choices dictated by the manufacturer of the tank, but I'd like to see it somewhere between halfway down and two thirds of the way down. So, somewhere in that lower half. The question was where should the buffer tank sensor be located? I always forget to repeat the question. Okay, uh, this is field data, and he has another parameter where he simply model, uh, monitors the cycle rate of the heat pump, and you can see how it cycles on, runs longer periods where there's more of a load, and we got hotter temperatures. So it, it's automatically adapting and running the heat pump as much as necessary. Electrify your heat. Now I asked earlier how many of you heat with fossil fuels and indeed that's our opportunity. And the future 
I believe, is going to reside on electrifying our heat. And I'm giving a talk next a couple of weeks from now up in Syracuse at a conference about this subject, presenting air source heat pumps and geothermal heat pumps and even electric resistance heat. But once we electrify it, we are in control of the emissions, the pollution, climate change, effluent, all that stuff. But the one thing I want you to keep in mind is that when you burn a fossil fuel, you don't just get carbon dioxide and water. There are a thousand other compounds that come out of combustion. And if any of you have lost someone to cancer and scratch your head, wonder why. I would suggest, without having any medical credentials at all, that the stuff we put in our air can influence our health. So they're known carcinogens that come out of our smokestacks. They waft down to the neighbor's yard and get inhaled by somebody. We can be blind to it, or we can try to eradicate the use of fossil fuels to heat our homes. We don't need to discuss climate change when we are already killing millions of people. UNICEF had this article, three million people die a year, 600,000 of them are children. Yeah, we can say, well, it's all in China because they don't know how to keep their air clean. I, I suggest that even though you can't see the crap in the air, it's still crap in the air. So that was my brief pitch about why. And now I get to play Steve Jobs. One more thing. You could do 100% of your domestic water heating by simply throwing a couple of three-way valves and an indirect tank that is properly sized. We use solar tanks with dual heat exchangers to keep that delta T to a minimum. But we've got dozens and dozens of jobs where we're heating 100% domestic hot water with no backup. And frankly, you know, these superheaters are nice, but they're more nice down south. I never was a big fan of these superheaters by themselves because you had to have 100% backup whereas this technique gives you 100% of your domestic hot water. Wait, there's more. What if you need supplemental heat? The way we size water to air heat pumps is we quite often put 5, 10, 15 kW of supplemental heat that doesn't amount to a lot of energy because it doesn't run very much but allows you to size a water-to-air heat pump at that 80%, 90% level and let that electric heat handle those really rough days as a supplement. In hydronic, this piping system allows for the same strategy. We've got an 11 kW inline electric heater that has an acceptable pressure drop and we simple cycle it when we have an extra need for heat. And you can combine the both of them in something like this. And then we go to it's time for questions. Yes, sir. Thank you, John, so far. Um, how are you sizing your buffer tanks? I size typically about 0.6 gallons per 1,000 BTUs. A five ton gets us into that gray area. I'm comfortable most of the time with 30 gallons, but I may push it to 50. A lot depends on the size of the load, the distribution system. multi-stage Yeah, we will look at the capacity on that low stage because it's really about having enough buffering capacity to handle that low load low capacity cycling rate. And I anticipate fully that a variable speed compressor will allow us to eliminate buffer tanks. We may still need a primary secondary piping system, but you 
you have a hydraulic coupler that allows the heat pump to operate at a very low speed so it doesn't overwhelm itself with feedback. So point six is the starting point and then we scratch our head a little bit from there. As a maximum design day water temperature requirement in the load. That's really pushing well, there's only a couple on the market that I know of that would even keep running. But they're out there. They should be further developed by other manufacturers. The hydronic market is going to uh, wake up and start moving in this direction. So. We can't live with heat pumps that enter a failure zone at 110 degree entering water. That's just not going to cut the need in the marketplace. So there's a couple out there that can get up to 145 leaving water temperatures uh, with our 410A, so that's good. Um, but yeah, so it's the nature of the beast. I've seen the charts. Yeah. Okay, what else? Okay, I appreciate you. none of you snoring today after such a great lunch. So thank you for being here. <laughs>